Rosa, do you want to do the introductions? Uh, sure, I can uh, start by saying that uh, we are very proud to, to finally get uh, this uh, partnership uh, started. We now ha are starting the ASP GTTP uh, joint webinars. It's a, a dream come true. For many years, we've been willing to collaborate and uh, bring these amazing resources to teachers all over the world. And now with, uh, the, the, with the, the first webinar, we are starting it. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, there couldn't be another, another better topic than if there's life out there. So I think that uh, it will be very interesting to see how, how much this webinar will reach out to our teachers out there, wherever you are. We are also working on translating the material because this is available to us in editable format and uh, we are uh, capable of translating it to other languages. We already have the Portuguese language, language ready. And so teachers can look to this webinar, share the webinar with the students, go through all the, the material, go through the activities. And uh, this is what we, we want to do today is uh, to navigate a little bit on these amazing resources that the ISP is, is creating. Vivian? Thank you, Rosa. It is so good to finally work with you, just like you said. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Vivian White calling you from my car in Oakland, California. I apologize. Um, this is just to show that you can do this activity anywhere. You don't need much <laughs> at all. Um, the activity follows a webinar that we just had on searching for exoplanets atmospheres and talking a bit about what we're looking for when we're looking for life in the universe. So the activity that I'm going to demonstrate today is called anyone out there and it's the question it's the big question are we alone and i think it's a a universal question i think that we are all thinking about this and our students it's an interesting question for our students um, and um, so this this uh, activity follows the drake equation the drake equation is not an equation with any answer that we know it's actually a thought experiment, a way to think about all of the factors that we would need to consider when we think about what are the chances that there is life in, in our galaxy. We'll start with just our galaxy because it's going to be hard to communicate with life in a distant galaxy. So we'll start with just the Milky Way galaxy. So I have a, a wonderful helper, Dave who is going to bring up the slides for me from his home. Um, and you can uh, find these, if you would go back to the very first slide, Dave, that will help me out. These, you don't actually need these slides. You can, um, uh, you can have a handout yourself and then give the, there are six factors to the question, the Drake equation. And if you look um, on, uh, forgive me, on the second page, Dave, you were right. The second page gives the presenter's view of what you would need to talk about as you go through each of these questions. So um, you can put the entire equation up on the board. The equation is up at the top there. Um, oh, sorry, it's, it's at the bottom. <laughs> um, there's a full write-up on this, but it, I think that uh, the equation is a good place to start so that it doesn't each of these variables has a meaning and we're going to talk about those meanings we're just going to run through it quickly so in a classroom what i do is i divide the students into six groups each one will be given a question so um, the first question for example is which fraction of stars in the milky way have at least one planet orbiting them now these questions, some of them we are beginning to understand better. Some of them we have no idea and we're just going to have to make guesses. And some, um, some are somewhere in between. So we don't actually know the answer to any one of these questions. This 
activity is to encourage students to think critically about a question. Um, so we won't, there is no right answer, and you should emphasize that in your classroom too, that there is not a right answer on this. There are only our best guesses, and, and we'll see what the class comes up with as, um, as a group. Rosa, please stop me if you have any questions along the way. If I've missed something, please just say the word. I just wanted to, to, to note that uh, exoplanets started to be found only in 1995. So it was yesterday on the history of astronomy. And I think it's very interesting to start the discussion with the students uh, talking about, uh, well, if we only started to discover them in 1995, why is it so difficult? Uh, and uh, People talk about aliens visiting us. Should we really think about that? Does it make any sense at all? So these are, are, are topics that are usually sparkling the creativity of the students. And I think Drake Equation is a nice way to, you know, to, to, to discuss how difficult these things can be, how yeah. difficult life in the universe can be. Right, right. It talks about all of the factors. So, um, uh, Dave, if you go back to the first slide, this is what we're going to start with. And you don't need this slide. You can simply write this number on your board or on a large piece of paper so that all the students can see this. This is 400 billion. So that's a lot, 400 million million. Um, that is the estimated number of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Now this picture here, it is not actually a picture of our Milky Way galaxy. It's an artist's conception of what it might look like. Um, but uh, because we can't actually get out of our Milky Way galaxy to see it. So, um, but this is about where our sun is. You can see there's a little indication there. Uh, just gives you an idea of how big it is and how many stars are out there. So I'm going to show you uh, that you can really do this anywhere. <laughs> I found a paper plate in my car. <laughs> and you only need, I'm going to do this right here along with you. You only need to um, have this number somewhere that everyone can see it. And then hand the questions out to your students. So let's go through and do this a little bit together. Um, Dave, if you want to go to the next slide, I can help you out there. So these, you can print these, all of these out themselves, or you can just write them down. So um, you'll see, actually, if you go one more slide, just so we can get an idea of what all of the students would get. Thank you. So each of these questions are written down. Um, the, the variable F sub P is on the right-hand side, and that's actually in the Drake equation, the, the particular variable you're looking at. So have your students research some of these questions, talk about them, think about them, and then give them some time to do that so that then we can come back and have an interesting discussion. So after they've had time to do this, um, let's just go through these fairly quickly and I'll show you how the activity works. The first question is when we take all of these 400 billion stars, what fraction of these have at least one planet orbiting them? Um, so, Dave, if you go back to slide two, this gives the teacher or the presenter the information to start working with, excuse me, <laughs> to start working with uh, these numbers. So, they might say um, half of all stars or a quarter of all stars might have a planet orbiting. That's actually a pretty good guess. Honestly, they're thinking, and this is, this is the real science of it, um, it, it appears that almost every star will have a planet orbiting it from what we have found so far. Um, but let's say that your students guessed half of all stars have a planet orbiting it, right? So in that case, um, if you look on the presenter cues there, um, if you say half of them, you would then cross off the four and write two. So, I'll just do that so that we have, and we're going to keep up with this as we go along. Hope you can see that. All right, so the first group made their guess. When you go to the second group, 
you can talk about the average number of planets that have the right environment to support life. Now, this is an interesting question. Um, there are additional activities that you can use to go along with this. We have um, why we think water is necessary activity um, and, and lots of other activities that go along with it. And they are linked in the activity write-up when you look at the full write-up. But for the rest of these, you are going to use the answer key below. If you think it, the very bottom left-hand side of that slide, if you think every single planet has the possibility for life, then you s don't cross off any zeros. If you think maybe one in 10, like in, the, in our solar system, maybe one in 10 of the planets in our solar system has the possibility for life. Now, we don't know this. We're not even sure. There may be life on Mars. There may be life on Titan, for all we know. We just don't know. Um, so... Vivian, yeah. just, uh, just uh, to add something here, because I know some of the misconceptions that appear now and then. Yes. When you say life, you don't mean life like us. You don't mean humans walking there. Well, it, it could be one of us walking there, but uh, coming from Earth, you don't, you, we don't expect... Uh, evolved uh, uh, bodies like our, like ours in those planets, do we? No, good question, Rosa. Actually, so we're talking any kind of life. It could be microbes. It could be a virus. It could be any sort of thing. We are not looking for intelligent life yet. We're just saying which kind of planets might have the right environment. And that actually speaks quite a bit to the teleconference, to the webinar we just had that goes with this video. So that would give some interesting clues there. So um, say your students guessed one in 10, something like what we know of in our solar system. Now, again, we could be wrong, um, but, um, but we're thinking in our solar system, maybe one in 10 planets have a chance for life. So that means you come over here and you scratch off one of these zeros, okay? So now we are at 20 billion. <laughs> We've come down by a factor of 10. So we're already reducing our chances for finding intelligent life. And we've only gotten to two questions. So, okay, Rosa, I'm, this one's for you. You're gonna have to make a guess on this one. Number three, on a world that has the right environment to support life, so maybe there is water and there are oceans and, um, things like that, on that world, how often does life develop? What do you think some questions could be around that? Well, I think that uh, with that, you can, you can do some uh, experiments uh, with uh, some tricks. I mean, you put water in, in, on the soil and life will appear. You know, if you have water, I, I have a feeling you cannot prevent life, but uh, you can sparkle that uh, idea if you do examples like this with the students, something that appears to be completely dead, you put a drop of water next day, ha, huh, what you guess, that you have life there. Absolutely. So here again, we only have this one, um, one example of life here. We don't know what life might look like elsewhere in the universe, so we don't know. Um, one really good clue for us on earth is that life began very early here almost as soon as we had oceans that were somewhat stable there was life so that's a good clue that it's not terribly hard that it didn't take many many billions of years for life to form but really that's kind of our only clue at this point so you want to say every time I would say that. I would guess that uh, every time you have water, you, I mean, even in, in ec extreme uh, conditions, life will appear. So that is my guess. That Wonderful. is my personal guess. That is great. Yeah, these are all just personal guesses. That's a great guess. Okay, so in that case, we're not going to cross off any zeros. That means every single planet that we find that has water on it, say, uh, will have a will eventually develop intelligent life. Fabulous. Okay, number five. Um, is anybody else up for taking on number five, guessing? How many intelligent mm -hmm. civilizations will ever communicate over interstellar distances? So that means life has evolved 
to a point where we could actually communicate out. Now, thinking a little bit about this, how long have we been able to communicate out to over interstellar distances? Does anybody want to take a crack at that? Is Thelina still on? Or Alvaro, would you like to take a try for that one? If you guys are speaking, your microphones are mute. Yeah, we can't hear you if you have something to say. Uh, I'm not so optimist and Rosa about <laughs> the and water. Uh, water is... Uh, is uh, necessary for our kind of life, uh, the kind of life we know, but uh, we don't know if uh, we could have other kinds of life not supported in water, in uh, other in other environments. Um, to talk about uh, intelligent civilizations and communications uh, over interstellar distance. Uh, it could be more difficult because um, we don't have yet uh, ways to, to give an approach in communication with other uh, civilizations if they, they exist uh, in some spots in the universe. Uh, it would be very diff difficult because uh, the distance uh, it could be very, very, very large uh, to, to do that. So, maybe the last one <laughs> of these. Okay, yes. Alvaro is not as optimistic as Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I guess that, uh, you know, we just don't, we, we didn't nail it yet, because the moment <laughs> we find out how to fine-tune it, we will find it. We will find it there. I am sure. really 100% secure. <laughs> So of, that's okay. but, but perhaps, you know, most planets stay for a long time. Maybe they are covered in ice. Maybe um, they're just dolphins that evolve. And we don't have these intelligent life forms that can look up and communicate outside of the planet. Or maybe there's a very thick atmosphere that they don't even know. Like, what if there's life on Venus with this thick atmosphere? Perhaps they don't even know what else is out there. Um, so, but I think Alvaro, that's a very good guess. So one out of a thousand civilizations being able to communicate is not unheard of. Um, that just means I am crossing out three more zeros, one, two, three, um, <laughs> and, and reducing our chances. I think that that, you know, that's a very realistic thing. The truth is we don't have any idea, right? We haven't heard from anyone, so we couldn't tell you. And we haven't even gotten that far. I mean, our our, for lack of a better word, our interstellar communications have not been happening, and they've only been accidental until about 40 years ago. Um, we, did, we have sent out purposeful messages, and you can have your students research some of that. Those are kind of interesting. The messages that we have sent out um, in hopes of reaching somebody are, are I think, inspiring, um, if maybe misdirected in some cases. <laughs> um, so You're and we will, about the voyagers. Yes, yeah, yeah, and we have voyagers, and those haven't even left our solar system. I mean, those are just at the edge of our solar system, so they will take a very long time to get anywhere interstellar in between stars. Um, okay, so the last question. <laughs> <laughs> the last question I think is the most interesting. Um, and, and I think important at this stage. The last question being, how long will this civilization that is quote unquote intelligent and communicating across interstellar distance, how long will they survive? Hmm. This speaks to a lot of our understanding and our worries and, um, and how we are treating each other. So I think this is actually a bigger um, ethical question that we're asking here. So. Here we have taken it as a fraction of the um, age of the universe so that we can now, uh, the, the number that we're actually getting is a little bit different than the other numbers. It's what fraction of the time that we've been here, will there be intelligent, intelligent communicating civilization? So we've made it about 40 years. 
um, as an intelligent communicating civilization. You could say 60 if you're really going to be, or you could even say 100 if you're going to be super optimistic. We've made it 100 years so far. How much longer do we think we are going to make it? This is sometimes a sad question <laughs> for people. So uh, le let me, actually, this is something that I wonder sometimes. I think that yeah. uh, we are always communicating to, to the world out there. I mean, anyone capable of observing our planet is capable of seeing us and seeing and everything that we're doing. Actually, every time we, 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 we broadcast a TV channel or whatever, we are communicating actively. But passively, I mean, without sending anything out there, every time I'm talking, I'm producing sound waves that might be transformed into something and detected by some very fancy technology. So right. uh, maybe since the moment we, we exist, we are sending signals out there. The, 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 the problem is, would anyone out there be smarter than us and a little bit older than us and capable enough of developing the technology to be able to, to detect this? You know, and, 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 and you said something that I, I think it's really important, which is not all uh, life uh, should be like us. I mean, not every, every being in the universe should walk into legs. I mean, Correct. if the dinosaurs would still be here, we wouldn't be here. Right. But they also would probably not be communicating over interstellar distances. Well, I, mean, I mean, they were when we left them or when they died out. Well, well, I think I, I think that I read a, a very uh, uh, interesting article saying that uh, scientists discovered that the brain of the dinosaurs, the their the skull, was changing size over time. Right. So you never know if they would no, develop no, intelligence. Very true. You know? Very. You true. would need a bigger car, though. <laughs> yes. Well, so this is just about the length of time, and and again, as usual, we only have one example, which is us. Mm -hmm. um, to look at how long do you think a civilization like ours might survive? Now, if you look at the options, um, it's, it's pretty optimistic already that maybe we will survive 10,000 years. That would be pretty amazing. Um, maybe we'll survive a million years or a hundred million years. Do you think we'll survive a billion years? So that's a tenth of the age of our galaxy. More, we're just rounding numbers here. Um, okay, Rosa, in your optimism, what do you think? How long do you think some sort, it doesn't have to be us, but some sort um, of intelligent okay. communicating <laughs> civilization will survive? Okay, well, not being us, uh, maybe a million years. You a know, million years? A, a million yeah. years, yeah. Uh, maybe a million years. Uh, there are some studies, you know, in, in, in the, the growth curve of, and, and then the decay of civilizations. I think uh, yeah. we all tend to decay if we don't get something new to mingle with. So I don't know, one million years, I think, would be really very good. That's fabulous. That is actually very optimistic. So if we survive for a million years, um, that is one ten thousand, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, one ten thousandth. The age of our galaxy. So I had to cross off an extra four zeros. And that leaves us with 2,000. Our guess for how many intelligent civilizations are communicating with us in our galaxy. Or I have the ability to communicate right now, really, is what that's asking. So that means if we look up and look out, that about two, our estimate is there are about 2,000 intelligent civilizations ready to communicate with us. That's a very optimistic number and a very exciting number to think about um, because it'll be interesting. Now we just have to figure out how to communicate with them, correct? <laughs> if we think there are maybe that many, that is exciting in our search for, what, for looking for other civilizations out there. Now it's not the answer. Just be really clear to say this isn't actually the real answer to what is going on. This is only our best guess from this classroom of five. <laughs> this is what we have come up with. Um, so, so this gives us, a, it basically allows us to think about what, what it is, all of the factors that we're going to have to take into consideration when we think about life 
elsewhere in our galaxy. So this can be the beginning of a discussion about exoplanets. This can be the end of a discussion. It can just get students thinking and being creative in some interesting ways. So that's pretty much the activity. And there is a whole write-up with more information about each of these factors. Um, you can have students, for example, look at all of the um, exoplanets that have been discovered so far. There's a list of those on a JPL website, ExoWorlds. Um, there are... There's a catalog out there. Yeah. So. Exactly. So, and, and as my car will show you, you can do this activity anywhere. <laughs> it is very simple. You need very few resources, but you can make it as detailed or um, involved as you'd like. So I, th I think this activity is, is sparkling many other things and uh, it's something that you can do rather quickly with your students. So even if you have curriculum constraint, which is the problem of almost all over the world, unfortunately. Yeah. You can use it for many things. And you can use it uh, for a, a, a very rich interdisciplinary activity where you have your colleagues from math, from physics, from biology, from geology, all of you discussing some curriculum content in this very nice activity. There's so much to be discussed here. So many ideas that uh, your students can have. So I, I think I will, pull, I, will, I will put a challenge here to the teachers. We have a, a group on Facebook. It's Galileo Teachers uh, group. Uh, it's uh, facebook.com slash group slash Galileo Teachers. And we would like to hear from you what you've done. So if you implement that in classroom with your students, let us know. Share with us uh, your experience. We would really like to hear uh, about uh, how did it go and uh, what were the conclusions of your students. I, I find it very interesting to, to ask students about their opinion on those topics. And uh, it's, it's usually it leads us to very, very rich uh, discussions. And uh, another thing that I would like to note is that uh, nowadays with the number of exoplanets that we know, and with robotic telescopes available, like uh, the ones from uh, Las Cumbres Observatory, the Fox Telescope, or the Micro Observatory from NASA, you can ask, uh, you can request images from known exoplanets, and you can also learn uh, how to, to follow them up and how to know or, or to rediscover the, 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 plan, the exoplanet with the students. So these are all things that you can communicate with us. We will be very glad to, to guide you on doing these activities with your students. And um, I also would like to say that uh, links to the materials in the different languages will be available in the Galileo Teachers page. And of course, in the ASP uh, repository, you can also find uh, these resources. But uh, we, we are uh, building a special hub uh, to host all these materials with the original webinar, with this webinar, and all the associated materials in all the different languages that we can manage to translate to. And this activity, just a note, was originally created for amateur astronomers. Um, so it's also good as an informal activity if you are doing this um, at a camp or um, if you brought out your telescopes but the clouds came in. It's a very good activity to kind of allow people to think about space in a way where you don't, you maybe don't have a chance to observe. There are, however, um, uh, night sky planispheres that show where all of the known planets with exoplanets, uh, sorry, known stars with exoplanets are. So you can look in the night sky. Right now they're just northern hemisphere, but we could certainly make them for the southern hemisphere as well. Um, all, where you can look up and see, oh, that star, we have found planets around that star. Well, there's one that is very notorious now in the southern hemisphere, which is Proxima Centauri. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's a close one. <laughs> yeah, it's the closest one to us, so it's yes. pretty cool to know that there is a planet over there that that, that might even be habitable. Yeah. You know, really that is exciting. another activity that we have to bring there, habitable zones, you know, right. how to, to find the planets where we can live in which is exactly. something you're still looking exactly. for. You and gave me an, a very nice idea, which is if you do this with your students, then you can, you can really train them and make them feel comfortable with the activities. And then you invite their families for a night of observing night or uh, just a, a science cafe where your students are the scientists. Yeah. 
yes. and they can run this activity with their families. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I hope that it's useful to you in your classrooms. So let us know what you do and come back with your questions and requests. We are taking we are taking your ideas and your your uh, questions and your requests to produce really a very nice set of uh, future webinars. This is starting today, and I hope uh, it will not end in the very very near or long future. <laughs> Thank you for Another the 10 million years. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this, Vivian. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Thank Rosa. You, Vivian. Thank you, Rosa.